Good morning. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Program. My name is John Coates. Today's date is August 14th, 2001, and this morning we are pleased to have with us Dorothy Ahern. Dorothy, good morning, and good thank morning. you very much for being with us. May I ask you how old you are? I'm 78. And your current marital status? Married. And do you have children? Three. Grandchildren? Four. Uh, Great-grandchildren? No. Okay. Where were you born, Dorothy? Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut. That's about 90 miles from here. Yeah. Were you raised there? Yes, I was. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your family? What did your mom and uh, father do? Well, my father was a trucker. I had one brother who was 13 years older than I was. My mom was stay-at-home mom. Uh, let's see. And she was, they were both born in Connecticut. My father was born in Fairfield. My mother was born in Tyler City, down near New Haven. And uh, what else would you like to know? I went to Mount St. Joseph's Academy, then St. Francis Hospital School of Nursing. Tell us about Connecticut. Uh, 78 years ago, uh, 78 years ago, what was it like when you were growing up there? Uh, perhaps maybe similar to what Natick is today, small town, even though it was a city. Uh, we would walk everywhere. Great public transportation was fantastic, not like it is today, because there isn't any today to mount anything. But you were a good walker. Oh, yes. And you mentioned that you went to the uh, public schools there. No, I went to the Catholic schools. Catholic schools. Uh, yeah, the cathedral grammar school. High school was uh, run by the Sisters of Mercy. And St. Francis is run, was at that time run by the Sisters of St. Joseph. And after you went through uh, the, the lower grades, where did, where did you go from there? The high school? High uh, school. Four and, years at the Mount. And then where? Then St. Francis for my uh, nursing training. Okay. Did you gravitate into nursing or that, that's a pretty important decision? I think my brother sort of gravitated me into it. Uh, he was married to one of our graduates and I think I didn't know where I was going when I was get, getting out of high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do and he talked me, kind of talked me into going to St. Francis and it was a great decision. Tell us a little bit about your training. What, what, is, what do you have to do or in those days? What did you have to do to become a nurse? Well, uh, we went from 7.30 in the morning uh, to 7 at night with possibly two or three hours off during the day. If we didn't have a class, we were lucky. Otherwise, we went those two or three hours, we went to class. We worked uh, six and a half days a week. We were supposed to have an afternoon off at week, which we did get. Sometimes we got, sometimes we didn't. They worked you pretty hard. Yes. Yeah. Well, we were backbone of the hospital staff, let's face it. And uh, that's, we had three weeks vacation a year, and you had to, if you lost any time during your three years because you were sick for any reason or even for a death in the family and you lost a day, you made it up at the end of your training so that you went exactly three years to the day. If you didn't lose any time, then you got off three, three weeks ahead of time. So they was, gave you uh, every reason in the world to come in every day. Yes, they did. <laughs> <clears throat> you told us a moment ago you graduated uh, in 1944. From St. Francis. Yeah. Yes. 1945 I went into the Army. This means that while you were in school there was a war on. The United States had been at war for three years then? Uh, I went in to training in September of 91 and of, of what year? 91. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 41. And the war started in December. 
Can you tell us where you were on Pearl Harbor Day? Homesick. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was you were told Sunday not to be sick. I was told not to be sick, but I had uh, had a immunization shot before I went in training, and it had uh, inf got become infected, and I was home uh, taking care of that. So I lost some time there. As a nurse in training and the United States going into a war, did you put those two things together and feel that uh, when you were a graduate that possibly you would be involved in that war? No, I didn't. It wasn't until I was graduating that they were desp apparently desperately needing nurses, the uh, radio, the newspapers, and so forth. And at that point is when I decided to go in the Army because they needed nurses so badly. You told, the, told me just before the tape started that uh, you thought about joining the Navy and you were one oh. inch too short. <laughs> yes, I went up. Oh, to, tell us about that. I, I went up to Bradley Field for my physical. We, we signed up through the Red Cross. I went up to Bradley Field for my physical, and the doctor up there took my height, and I was 4 feet 11. He said, well, you can't go in the Navy. You have to go in the Army, because the Army regulation was 4'10". Navy, you had to be at least 4'11", and I wasn't. So I went in the Army. So that decided your future, right? Then yes. There, one inch. <laughs> you graduated in 44 and went in the service in 45. Did you have a year there to think about going into service? or No, I didn't. Uh, it was uh, no. immediately after? It was very shortly after, in 44, after I graduated. And I passed my state boards. That was important, that I decided to go in the, into the service. Went down to the Red Cross in January of 45 and signed up. What did your family think of that? I didn't tell them. It wasn't until I got home that my mother said to me, you didn't even tell me you were going to go in the Army. I said, no, I didn't, did I? How did you explain to her the need that you felt? You didn't explain things to my mother. How did you try to explain to her? Well, mother? I said, I understand that they're, because of the war, nurses are desperately needed, uh, especially overseas. So I thought I'd try and do what I could to help somebody. In the spring, <clears throat> excuse me, in the spring of 45, the war was pretty close to being over. What did the government tell you that made you feel nurses were needed at that time? Uh, the government was telling us at the end of 44 that nurses were needed. And I don't really, they were still needy, needed because we were replacements for the people who had been overseas or in the Army or in the Navy for several years already. Mm -hmm. Some of the nurses that we replaced had been in the whole uh, uh, Pacific campaign. So we were their replacements so they could go home. And then we stepped in to take up their jobs. Okay, you're, you're now a member of the United States Army mm -hmm. in the nursing corps. Yeah. And uh, tell us about leaving home. Where did you go? <laughs> I, For basic training, I went to Fort Devens. We were there a month. Then I came to Cushing Hospital, and it was an Army hospital. I was there six weeks. From there, I went to Jackson, South Carolina. I was there a month. From there, I went to Marysville, California, to Fort Beale. It was Camp Beale at the time. I was there a month. I then went to Camp Anza, in the down lower California, and from there I went on board ship and went overseas. Okay. So I was moving every <clears throat> month. Let's back up a second. You went to Fort Jackson. Um, had you ever been out of Massachusetts up at that time? Up until that time? Uh, I had been to Washington. I'd been to New York. I'd been to Maine. Yes, I had been out of Massachusetts. Had you been to? The I had South been out of Connecticut. Were you prepared for the southern um, change of climate here as we uh, I, take you away from home? I didn't get prepared for it, no. I knew it was going to be warm, but 
didn't think much of it. How about culturally? Did the Army say you're going to another world when you're going oh, down no. to Fort Jackson? No. Did you get into Columbia and walk around and yes, see the place? Yes, we got place? into Columbia. My friend and I used to go into Columbia every night to get watermelon. <laughs> we'd, we'd go into and at one of these little uh, benches along the side of the street and we'd go in there and we'd eat watermelon because it was so good and we were not used to having so much of it. At Fort Jackson or at, at Fort Devens for that matter, uh, in the training, what did you like about the training that you got or what did you dislike about it? Um, I don't know if I stopped to think. We got up, we had calisthenics in the morning, we had our regular routine that most places have in basic training, the, the films and so forth, and I never thought whether I liked it or disliked it. I just did it. I, I, I didn't stop to think about whether I was going to like it or not. It was what I was supposed to do, so I did it. You moved around a lot. The yes, Army I did. put you on more trains that you'd like to think about. Oh, yeah. Um, Took a train. Did they pre prepare you? for other cultures, other places, particularly where you might be sent to eventually overseas? No. Did you think I, you might go to Europe, perhaps? No, I didn't know where I was going. I just figured I'd take it as it came. And they didn't say, we're sending you to Europe or the, the Pacific or anything. They just sent us. We did, weren't instructed ahead of time. The only thing you could think of was when they started giving you uh, cholera shots and a few other things that you might possibly be going to tropics because we did get a cholera shot before we left Boston. And <clears throat> did you develop a specialty as a nurse? Yes. Uh, I had a specialty when I went into the Army the last few months of my training and then until I went in in the operating room. So when I was out in California, we had to go to an interview for placement. And I told the young man that was interviewing me that I was an operating room nurse. And he put me down that I did that when I got overseas, which I was very thankful for. And because while I was over there, uh, I had never had neurosurgery training. Mm. And I had it overseas. And I had done it after I got back quite a bit. Did you develop any uh, personal relationships along the way? Uh, friends who went uh, with you during these many train rides that you yeah. took? One of the girls that was in training with me, one of my classmates, and I stayed together until we got overseas and went at the hospital overseas. And I came home about a month ahead of her. Yeah. But other than that, I didn't keep up with anybody that I met up with. Can you tell us approximately when you went overseas? We left uh, San Diego Harbor two days before the war was over in Japan. That, I guess it's around the 13th of August, 1945. And we were, on, we were on a hospital ship, the Comfort. That was the one that had been struck by the kamikaze pilot. And it had been repaired, and we went over on that. And it took us something like 28 days to get across the Pacific. This was two the, days before the war ended? Yes. So you were at sea. When the war was declared over. And did you think, well, they're just going to turn this thing around and we're all going to... Yes, we go. did. <laughs> <laughs> we thought maybe we'd get to Hawaii. <laughs> I take it you did not get to Hawaii. We did not get to Hawaii. I've been there twice since, but not at that, on that trip. And uh, we went, we island hopped going over. And I wish I could remember na all the names of the island we hit because we'd go in and refuel. Or we'd go in for some reason or other, whatever. It was a Navy ship. Was this an APA or what size ship was it? It was a hospital ship and I don't know it, the what comfort, size it. Yeah. The, the Comfort, the That's USS That's a pretty comfort. good size ship. Yes. There was a Navy detachment on the ship plus close to 500 nurses that were being taken to the Philippines. Were all the nurse, nurses um, kind of in your class in, in terms of experience? Were they all replacements? We were all replacements for the people who had been over there. 
uh, and some of them had been over there three and four years. Going over, you you must have sat around and, and talked about your druthers, where you like the, your ideal assignment. Uh, what was your feeling going over? I'm on here. I don't like on, I don't like ships. Uh, and we sat on the deck. We didn't have chairs to sit in. And uh, I don't remember talking about to anybody too much about what we wanted to do or what we expected from the Army. We just took it as it came. Do you recall who else might have been on board with you? Were there other, uh, were there a lot of guys on the ship going overseas as? O only Navy personnel. Just Navy. The nurses that were going over were all women. They had a, a complement of Navy personnel who worked the hospital part of the ship when it was coming back to the States. That we, and we never saw them. They never mingled with us. We never saw them. Tell us, and, and all the people watching this tape who would not have this experience, what is a hospital ship like? Take us inside it. To tell you the truth, I didn't see the hospital part of the hospital ship. We slept in, was it hammocks that the Navy uses? Uh, we had those, we were down where the patients would be on the way back, but we never saw the hospital itself, the hospital part of the ship. And we never saw the, the Navy personnel. They had their own quarters and we were in the hospital area and the, the bunks were three up, three bunks. Oh, those infamous bunks. Yes. <laughs> Did you have a good passage over, was it? Uh the, fir calm. the first week was terrible. I was sick the whole week. <laughs> I haven't gone on a ship since. But uh, I was sick. And the first, we left on a Sunday. And that Saturday was the first time I went down to the mess hall or whatever they call it in the Navy. And I looked at the, the uh, buffet, what well, was cafeteria style. And I looked at, I said, beans? <laughs> They said, yes, it's Navy tradition to serve beans on Saturday. I skipped them. I didn't eat them. <laughs> that's right. That's cold cut night for you. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I, I'm not, and I haven't eaten them very often since. <laughs> now you told us you were 28 days aboard, is that correct? Yes. Where does 28 days take you to? All the way to Manila? Took us to Manila by way of several different islands where we pulled in for refueling. Uh, and we, we first came, went into Subic Bay, and we were there a couple of nights, or a couple of days, before they took us down to Manila. Tell us about Subic Bay. It was pretty much a mess, wasn't it? I get, you, you want me to think back f over 50 years. <laughs> we I, I we never got would... off the ship to see anything. Never. The whole 28 days we were on the ship and we've never, we never got off to see any of these islands that we stopped at. At, at Subic Bay, at any, did, any did you see any war damage or the results of uh, the I fighting? I think we saw been? some, but I can't remember exactly what it was. Okay, and were you excited about you anxious to get off the ship, I take it? Well, yeah, we were tired of it. On uh, board ship, did they give you your assignments or where did you find out where you were going? Uh, we didn't find out where we were going until we got into Manila at an, a center there that did all the assignments. And then they assigned us to different hospitals in, on, in the Philippines. And what, and what was your particular assignment? My assignment was about a mile outside of Clark Field, the 248th General Hospital. And what, what about the, the hospital or the facilities that you were working? Uh, were they good, bombed, wrecked? No, no, they, they, were, they were in good shape. They were in good shape. It was about uh, 150 miles north of Manila, where we're, I think Clark Field is that far north of Manila. And the 13th, I think it's the 13th Air Force were there at the time. And we were, uh, when we first got to our hospital, uh, we were under guard. They had the compound for the nurses were, was all enclosed, 
with a canvas wall and uh, at every entrance into the compound there was an armed guard 24 hours a day and you weren't allowed to go any place off the hospital grounds with anyone that wasn't had sidearms that didn't have sidearms so if we went to an over to Clark Field for a party or anything whoever took us over had sidearms I think why is a, that Dorothy what was because the of snipers there were still snipers in the general area Japanese snipers and they this had, is after the war this is after the war it was after let me see about the 15th of September it was after the war there were still snipers in the general area where we were that's one whole month after the peace yeah. treaty yeah and we had uh, guards like that for about until about the first of the year first of the year they took them off the post did you your, yourself ever hear of a sniper incident or did any of your friends experience anything I like don't this? remember having any experience like that I know I used to take call for the operating room and the uh, supervising nurse would come over and tell the guard that I was needed and they would escort me to the operating room because of snipers it's a kind of shallow question but how did this make you feel were you apprehensive about this or no <laughs> felt you Maybe. were in danger I, 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 I figured they'd take care of me they were the ones with the with the guns they could take care of me and get back at the sniper well, and a, I'd be fine that's a good theory <laughs> <laughs> well maybe I was kind of innocent right Bob <laughs> Clark Field was precisely that place in the Philippines that was first bombed by the Japanese when the war began mm -hmm. could you see any results of any of that uh, while you were there uh, well, actually, about the only part we saw at Clark Field was the officers' club and the pool, the officers' club, and we didn't really, s except when you went over to Clark Field in the morning, on your day off, and they would give you let you get on the shuttle to Manila for the day. That was a big deal if you could do that, and we'd see the we'd see the planes all lined up, but uh, no destruction. I don't remember any destruction. It may be there, but I, I don't remember mm -hmm. any of it. Can you tell us about going into Manila one month after the war had ended? There you saw destruction. You saw The city the, was destroyed. The city was destroyed, except the one place that wasn't destroyed was the cathedral. It was an absolutely gorgeous cathedral. And when you went in, it had, uh, I believe it was silver. The, the bottom of the altar was all hammered silver but uh, the rest of the city was destroyed and the other thing that impressed me about it none of the roads were paved they don't didn't have many paved roads we were I grew up in Hartford all our roads were paved but they the Filipinos didn't have paved roads and when they went in their jitneys their little buses mm -hmm. they crowded them they sardined them in so that they just uh, we had a couple of accidents two days and two nights in a row where one of these buses went off into the rice paddy going along the road and they came to our hospital because it was the only hospital available and we had to take care of them I mean like 25 people all of a sudden we got the next night we got the same amount but we were prepared for them. different people oh yeah but the jitneys off into the off into the rice paddies because the rice paddies were right along the road was your rank at this time you were a second lieutenant or yes. a lieutenant no second lieutenant and you're dressed up in a nice spiffy uniform we've we've seen pictures of you you're, you're a good looking officer you're a long way from home and you're in a place called manila or clark field how did you feel about this? Did you feel um, safe? Well, I, I don't ever remember feeling nervous about being in that area because I figured that the men around me were going to take care. 
the enlisted men and the officers that we dealt with were very good to the nurses. They watched out for us. And, uh, but, but I, I never dwelled on thinking about what I could get myself into. I just did it. Maybe it's just as well. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have opportunities to go sightseeing? Did you see any of um, anything of Corregidor or Bataan? No. Or any of no. the camps north of uh, uh, north of No. Uh, what we did do, though, uh, we were working at the hospital, and this I think he was a captain walked in, and it turned out the, to be one of the my friend uh, Helen uh, worked in the, in the sterile supply room, which was in the in the OR itself. And this man walked in, and we re re recognized him. He was stationed at Fort Oda uh, Camp O'Donnell, north of where we were, and he had been one of the interns that we knew when we were in training. But other than that, we didn't see. They sent us on uh, rest R&R &R down south of Manila, and then another time they sent us up to Baguio, which was another 100 miles north of us up in the mountains, and uh, it was mo very mountainous up in that area, but we still had hot weather. Pretty rugged country. Oh, wasn't yes. It? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about a typical day as a nurse, an operating room nurse, what kind of work you were doing, on whom, who were your patients? Okay. Uh, we'd all go to work at 7 in the morning, and we would be assigned a particular room. As you know, an operating room is a group of other rooms. And we were assigned a particular room and given, given the schedule of the people that were due to go in that room. And I primarily was a scrub nurse. So I would have one enlisted man helping me. And I would scrub for the major cases uh, until they were done. Can you tell us what a scrub nurse is, please? scissors, please, and you hand it over. Okay. <laughs> We're the ones who uh, pass the instruments to the surgeon. And uh, the other thing that was very important was to keep track of the sponges that were used for a sponge count. It doesn't oh, sound yes. like much, <laughs> but it is. It's important. One of our sponges is missing. Yes, yeah. and then that's when you spoke up and said, you're not getting anything else, doctor, until you find that sponge. And more than once I said it, <laughs> even when I got back. You told them that before they closed up. The oh, yes. yes, yes. You had to take the sponge count before they started closing. And if you were missing a sponge, you had to let them know. And you, that's the same today as it was then. They still do the same thing. Now, who were your patients? Patients, primarily, we were in a U.S. Army hospital. Therefore, we were primarily had patients who were uh, Army men, we didn't have any women, uh, Army men who had been injured or were sick or had to have their appendix out or whatever, of United States Army men. And then once in a while, as I said, if once in a while they'd bring us in an accident that the, were Filipinos. The people off the bus. Yes, yeah. the, off the two buses. I re very remember that because uh, I was in charge at the time, and I said to the surgeon, the chief of surgeon, I said, we can't do any work today. We don't have any sterile goods. And he said, oh, you got, I said, we don't have anything to work with. So he canceled the whole schedule, fortunately, because that following night we got 25 more in. And we had worked all day getting our sterile supplies ready, and we used them that night. So it was fortunate that we didn't try and do a, a schedule. But we got by. These Army people that you worked on, was this a residual from the war? Were these guys who had been wounded? Yes. And they were still needing medical yes. care? Yes. How come they weren't shipped uh, back to the States? <laughs> well, I don't, maybe they weren't able to be shipped back. Mm. Uh, and and maybe it was, I know one bad accident we had was the man was driving too fast on these roads. And, and his, 
his Jeep overturned. So things like that. It was whatever the, and then of course we had the, uh, we were working with all the military units in the area, including Clark Field. So if they had an accident with one of the planes, we'd get the patients. So you did cross service lines. How come you didn't get any Navy? Because the Clark Field is not anywhere near uh, the Navy bases. What, how, what, how wide an area did you cover then? Maybe 100 miles? We could probably covered 75 miles. Yeah. In one direction. Because and that was all Army? All Army. But we didn't get, we got prisoners of war. We got Japanese prisoners of war at one time who came into the operating room and worked with us cleaning the rooms after a surgery. And they would come in every morning and bow down to you and say good morning. And then a little while later you'd have one of the, a Filipino man come in who was a full colonel to make sure the prisoners of war were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And they, they were just helping us clean up. But that was towards the end of when I was leave, getting ready to leave, or they were getting ready to have me leave. Had these Japanese uh, prisoners themselves been wounded? Not to my knowledge. They weren't, were, we did not have to work on them. Uh, they had been at some uh, camp somewhere around the area and they just brought them in to help us. And we had uh, nice clean floors and nice clean rooms because they were there to do it. Were there then, in fact, uh, large Japanese POW camps uh, uh, near you? There was one nearest, but I don't know how large it was. Yeah. Did you see Japanese uh, in any other setting? No. No, that was the only setting I saw them in. But apparently when we first got there, they were still do acting as snipers. I'm mentally trying to put together your, where you were with Mount Pinatubo, um, this great eruption that took place that, uh, of a volcano that finally wiped out Clark Field, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Did you go sightseeing and see anything like that? You didn't go sightseeing. You very rarely went sightseeing. I remember the one time when we did go sightseeing near the hospital was to a pygmy camp, the, the Negritos, the pygmies. We went to their They're village. They're too short for the Navy, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, we went to their village and met them. But other than that, there isn't much to see in the area. There wasn't much to see in the area. Tell us about the pygmies, really. Uh, they were shorter than I were was. You, <laughs> <laughs> were uh, you there out there to lord it over them, or? Oh no, 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 no. We went over and we we spoke to them. They may some of them understood English, some of them didn't, but we spoke to them, you know, and uh, we just sort of socialized with them for a very short time, maybe an hour. This was not an official medical. No, uh, it was not, and they were very short people. They were. Let's see, I was only 4'11", so they couldn't have been maybe four feet and with dark, very dark skin. Uh, almost, they weren't black, black. they were what I'd saw chocolate, mm -hmm. but they were, they were dark, dark skinned. Can you tell us about any other meetings you had with uh, uh, the Philippine people and your, your opinion of them? Uh, the ones that I met, were very hard workers. We had Filipino uh, ladies that did our laundry, and our shirts were beautifully done. And we met up with people who did uh, made things. In fact, we all got uh, old parachutes, and they made gold parachutes. Old. Oh. <laughs> and they made uh, nightgowns for us or robes. And, I brought my nightgown and my negligee home with me. <laughs> They're silk, is that right? Yeah, yeah. they were silk. Yeah. And uh, it's, I can't think of anything else. You haven't mentioned uh, people from other countries or other armed forces. Did you 
meet up with the British or Canadians or anybody else? No, we else? did not. We, not where we were. You see, we were about 100 and 150 miles north of Manila. We were out of the general area where a lot of the Canadians would have, or British would have been. They weren't up there in those mountains, up there in that area. Did you consider yourself a, a pretty isolated unit? Mm. Kind of off uh, by yourselves? Well, we knew we were quite a ways from Manila, uh, but I don't think we bothered. We made, we were socialized with the people on the hospital grounds. So we never thought about anybody else. How many of you were there in, in your particular group? Oh, the hospital was quite spread out. Uh, and they had, similar to the way Cushing was made, they had these long uh, wards, they called them. And there was probably 30 or 40 in a ward. And I would say there were probably a total between Patients and staff, there were a couple, a couple hundred, yeah, at least a couple hundred. You were a lieutenant. What was the rank of the doctors? What was a typical doctor? First lieutenant or captains or higher. The uh, chief of surgery was a lieutenant colonel. Um, when he went home, because he had been with the original unit, which was the Mayo Clinic unit. In fact, I, th I, I have a vague remembrance of meeting Charles Mayo. Because, really? Yes, a day or two These after I two got two famous doctor yes, brothers. Yes, and that's what they call it, the Mayo Clinic unit. And those are the people that we uh, came in and took their places. But they had been all over New Guinea and the whole Pacific. But they were the Mayo Clinic unit. What typically brought a patient to you? Was there a commonality of uh, wounds or diseases? Um, you haven't mentioned diseases, but you're in a tropical country, and I'm sure the tropical, you ran I'm sure into there was a, a, probably a ward that had the malaria patients and so forth. But being in the operating room, we didn't see them. Uh, the operating room staff was a unit by itself, and we never interchanged with the wards. In other words, if you could have a nurse on one ward who would be sent to another ward to work, but we, had, we didn't have that. We were a unit on our own, and we never had to go to the wards to help out because an operating room has different training than another mm -hmm. nurse. And I had had extra training. I had my own month at my home at St. Francis, and then I finished my time and I worked in the operating room, uh, like sort of like a postgraduate. I was a graduate nurse, and they treated me as such. So I had a few extra months in an operating room that most nurses didn't have when they first got out of training. How about you personally, Dorothy? How, how was your health? Uh, what did the tropics do to you or Manila? After I was there, about two weeks, I got dengue fever with a temp of 105. That's pretty serious. <laughs> they put me in the hospital, and I was off duty for four or five days, and then I went back, back on duty. If, if treated, that's something you recover from? Yes, you, you do recover. If treated, you recover from it. It is not like malaria. Uh, malaria, you can have a recurrence of. I've never had a recurrence of it. All I can remember about, besides the temperature, was the eyeballs. Your eyeballs are in, Yellow, in, isn't it? Yeah. in pain, so terrific pain. You couldn't move your eyes right or left or at all. You, you look, stared straight ahead because every time you move them, you've got these pains in your eyeballs. That's what I remember of dengue fever. How do you get dengue fever? How do you it's think malaria, you got uh, it? Mosquito. It's something from a mosquito yes. again. Yeah. Lord, Esther, you think things like this would have been uh, wiped out by the time you got there? Not in the tropics. 
you can still get malaria. But we were on a um, malaria drug to prevent malaria. Were you taking Adabrin? Yeah, we were taking Adabrin. And I had started taking it when I got as far as California. And we took it every day. And uh, I still got the dengue fever. Did others in your unit get things like this? Oh, yeah. A few others. It wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. No, that you're <laughs> saying it that way, it's, it's not a big deal. Yeah, but a few others did. I mean, we didn't, wait, we didn't have a, uh, a uh, what's the word I want? <laughs> we didn't have a whole lot of people with dengue at one time. We'd get it once in a while, we'd have somebody. And it didn't make any difference whether you're one of the nurses or one of the enlisted men or what. You got it, you got it. So in a sense, you, you, you got kind of casual about something that was pretty serious, didn't you? Well, I guess I did. <laughs> I, we, I got the dengue fever. We, they did what they had to do for me. I recovered from it. That's it. And I haven't had it since. I understand from um, talking to people and, and some reading I've done that the Philippines are, are, are a very beautiful place and that a lot of people who served there were very reluctant to come home. Oh. It well, disabused me of that. Uh, yes. Is, is that not true? Well, the nurses that I worked, well, at that time, they were sending nurses home from the Philippines with a point, of, point average of seven. You got so many points for this and that and so forth. And if you had seven points, you were sent home. This is the spring of uh, 46. You were sent home. So therefore, we were anxious. And we found out that the nurses, it was the heat, I think, more than anything, and the, and the, the dirt. All I can remember is that the roads were not paved. It was dusty and hot. Um, we were sent home, they were sending people home at seven points. We found out that the nurses in Manila who had come over with us on the Comfort were being sent home. We had our orders to come home printed out. The, the colonel had them, but within a half hour or so they were canceled. So they were keeping us there and sending the ones that were in Manila home. We couldn't, we, we didn't like that. So one of our doctors got a hold of a Jeep and he took four of us down and we went to uh, the headquarters. The chief nurse said, well, you have to take care of that. I said, we, fine, we're not complaining that we aren't going home. We don't want to be isolated up here with our seven, our qualifications to go home and have the nurses in Manila be sent home with the same qualifications. If you're going to keep us here, keep them. Well, by the time we got back from Manila to our hospital, our orders were in that we were to go home. Oh, you're a good salesperson. <laughs> yeah, I was mad. <laughs> Did you ever hear any reasoning why that uh, disparity no. had taken place? No. And it wasn't that they didn't have just, a replacement. Just an army goof up? And well, I have no idea. But by the time we left Manila and got back, we got the, the jeep came into the compound, and the people were out clapping, you made it, you made it, you're going. So after that happened, and they had replacements, I was sent to the dental clinic to work for about three weeks before I was taken down to Manila and put on a plane to come home. Let's go back to the very beginning for something I forgot to ask you. When you joined the United States Army, under what circumstances? What were your contracts uh, with them so for the duration, duration of the war? For the duration. So that then you got into a different point system. And then the Army made up a point system 
and I believe the enlisted men were part of it, that if the enlisted men had so many points, they could go home. In fact, our whole army personnel were on this point system. If you had been in it so many months, if you had whatever, I don't remember all the details of it, but it was a point system. I think it was a, a different system because uh, during the war, anybody with seven points uh, was told to turn out the lights when he went home because he would be the last guy to go home. You needed about 120 points to go well, home. Well, you see, they've, apparently they had been using the higher points and sending people home, and they got down to the, the end of it. All you need was seven to go home. And you had that seven. Was, that was like uh, probably May of 46, and the war had been over close to a year. So you put in one year overseas. Yes. And you got points, and you're going home yeah. now. Yeah. How did you get home? They flew us home. Ah. They flew us home out of Manila. Actually, I think it must have been Clark Field, but anyhow, they flew us home. Uh, 72 hours of flying time, but three days. Three days, is that right? And three of those days we spent on Guam because we island hop. We went from island to island to island. And they take us off the plane and serve us a meal, refuel or whatever they had to do, and put us back on the plane. We got as far as Guam and we were there for three days because they confiscated the plane that we had come in on to go out and search. They must have had a plane down mm -hmm. or something. We were told a plane was down. They were searching for that plane. And they confiscated, I guess, all the planes they could get for this search party. Were you at Aganya sitting around? Is that where you were in Guam? I don't know where I was. We didn't leave. What, what did you do we for the three days? Sat around. <laughs> <laughs> Twiddling your thumbs. Twiddling our thumbs yeah. for three days. We were living in Quonset huts on the Navy base. But uh, I don't remember doing anything but sort of wasting time. Waiting for a plane. Yes, waiting for them to come back and say, we've got a plane for you. And when one came, where did they take you from there? From there, well, it took us to the rest of the islands. And the only one I can remember is Johnson, which is just east of Hawaii. It's 714 miles from Honolulu. Is it? Yeah. Well, that's one of the islands that we went to. And then we, we went to um, the Army, the uh, air base in Hawaii, in Honolulu. So you finally got to Hawaii. Two hours I was in Hawaii. And Were you at Hickam Field waiting around? Hickam there? Field, yeah. waiting around. And then we left there and we went to Fairfield Susan Air Base in California. And from there, I went to Fort Dix. This is the spring of 46. Yes. You're getting home. Yeah. And you're at Fort Dix now. Did you miss the Philippines at all, or were you glad to get out of there? I don't like the heat, so I was kind of glad to get out, although the heat didn't bother me. It was very dry, very dry heat. I got used to it. Uh, I was kind of glad to get home. I got off the, came up from Fort Dix and got off the train in Hartford, and the, my mother and brother were going to meet me, and my mother walked right by me. And my brother said, hey, here she is. <laughs> of course, I was in uniform. Other people were in uniform. My mother didn't realize it was me. You changed I had that been, much in a year. I yeah. had been taking the Atabrim. Oh, your complexion. <laughs> my was, complexion yeah. was very yellow, very yellow from the Atabrim. And she didn't recognize me. Walked right by me. Can you tell us about the, the impact of leaving Clark Field? You go to Manila, you go to Guam, all of these places. And you're home in Connecticut, and people uh, are walking around you like you'd been down to the bakery for a year instead of off at the war. How did you feel about this? I was home. I was glad I was home. I was out of the, well, it was summer by that time. and. Uh, because I got back 
and as I say, I ended July out of the Army, and uh, I just went along and I thought, well, I'll, eventually I'll get a job. In the meantime, I had my discharge money. I didn't need one right away. <laughs> and, uh, but I can remember the doorbell rang at my mother's house, and I answered it, and it was this man was there, and he said, I'm from such and such a radio station, and I have a question of you, and we're going to give you, if you can answer it, was one of these things. And you know, like, I don't know, but it was some ridiculous question. And I answered it. He said, well, now we have presents for you for answering our question. And he gave me five dollars and a bunch of bananas. I had just... That's just what you wanted, isn't Just it? what I needed. Yeah. A bunch of bananas, which I didn't eat. Fortunately, my brother had children by then, so I gave them to my sister-in-law. But I, we had green bananas, red bananas, small bananas, big bananas for the whole year before that. And I didn't care for bananas to begin with. And here he is giving me about 10 pounds of bananas. Do you remember what the question was? No, I don't. <laughs> but it was probably who's the governor of Connecticut or something like right. that. Right. Yeah. One of those tough ones. Yeah. With uh, what rank uh, were were you uh, finally discharged? The second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Yeah. Okay. So you came out of the uh, service as an officer. Yeah. Uh, did you go into any um, veterans organizations? No, I didn't. Are you a member of one now? No, Anything like I'm that? Not. Any particular reason? I guess because I'm not a joiner. I don't join very many organizations. Uh, while I've lived in Natick, I was working a lot, part-time, even with the, having the kids, I still work part-time down at the hospital, Needham Hospital, Natick Hospital, and I just never, never was in a, but then my husband isn't a, a joiner either. He could have joined the American Legion, but he didn't. And I could have joined the VFW, but I didn't. I'm just not a joiner. Okay, that's uh, a lot of people are not. Can you tell us if there's, uh, of, of all the things that you did in service and people you met and everything, is there one memorable experience that pops up more often than not? Something you could tell us about on this tape that you remember, something that sticks out in your mind? I. Well, the one thing is the fact that when I first got overseas, I had never, or got into the Army, I had never done neurosurgery, and they taught me how to work with the doctor uh, doing brain work, brain surgery, neurosurgery. And I was the only, work, there were, oh, maybe four nurses in the operating room, and I was the only one that was doing it. So when I came back, I worked at Cushing, and I was doing it up there. But basically, my training in it was in the Army overseas, and uh, I did it after that. But I, see, that's, I'm not, I can't think of anything that is really outstanding. I, you you mem uh, mentioned going into the cathedral in uh, Manila and uh, going to see the pygmies. I just wondered if there's anything, not necessarily overseas, but something that happened to you in that time you were in the service, that when you tell people stories about your life in the service, this one pops up more than anything else. Is there anything like that? No, not that I can think of. The only thing that I can think of that is, gives you kind of a chuckle is we took a, Oh, about an eight-hour train ride from Manila to the hot, up to the area where we were at Upper Angeles. We were going to get assigned to our hospital. We, they put us on trucks. We got over to the hospital area. I'm walking along with the chief, with the head of the nurses, the chief nurse, and I'm talking to her. And the next thing I know, I'm sitting in a mud puddle. I slid in the mud right down. <laughs> And I, you know, she had to help me. How do you meet your chief nurse? 
without sliding in a mud puddle. But, and I had no, no big thing. Uh, as I said, we had two days where we had to take care of Filipinos, two nights in a row, and because of the jitneys going in the ice paddies. But other than that, I don't remember anything. Of course, it's 50 years ago, or it's more than 50 years ago. I think also a part of what your answer is that if it appears to have been routine all the way, it yeah. shows you were in, working in a good place. Yeah. That if there weren't, you know, terrible things happening all the time, uh, if things were pretty well under control. The things were very much under control, and as I said, uh, we had armed guards when we first got there because of snipers, but after they took those off. Uh, the night supervisor would come over and wake me up and say, you got a case coming. So I'd just get up, get dressed, and go over and do my case, and that was it. Uh, I can't remember anything spectacular at all. It was just, I did the job, and that was it. How about a memorable character? We've run a, a, a good range of people here from Japanese prisoners to pygmies to yeah. uh, people that you went to school with. Anybody that stands out that you think about or are still in touch with? Oh, I'm not still in touch with any of them. How about the guy that gave you the bananas? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea who he is yeah. or was. But are, was there anybody in the service that uh, you think about that you, you had a good friend there? Oh, probably not. That I, I didn't keep up with any of them. Uh, we had a chief of surgeon who was very easy to work with, and uh, very. Uh, we were comfortable with him, and he liked our work. And uh, I just, no, it's it was routine, I guess. I. I What did you do when you came home uh, after you took off your uniform and threw away your service shoes? Well, uh, I didn't wait. I waited until after Labor Day. I'd gotten home the middle of July, waited until after Labor Day. I went back to work at St. Francis. Uh, at that time, there was supposedly a regulation that if you had left a job to go into the service, you had some kind of a guarantee or possible guarantee that that job would be waiting for you when you got out. In my case, it wasn't. I came home. I went. And they did. They put me on the floor. I worked on the floor for a while, and uh, they said, "Oh, well, there's no openings in the operating room." In the meantime, they hired people ahead of me, so I got a little annoyed after. A month or so of that, and I walked into the nun's office one day and said, I quit. She said, why? I said, I was supposed to get my old job in the operating room back when I got out of the service. And I said, you've hired three other people in the meantime and not put me back where I belong. So I tell you what, I don't want to stay here. So I quit. Came up to work at Cushing in a VA hospital in the operating room. Uh, I, I've forgotten where I think I had to come up to the VA office in Boston to apply for the job. And they were hiring for the operating room up at Cushing. And uh, I was, I think, the last one hired. And I worked there three years. Then I had a family, so I didn't go back there. In the meantime, I worked at the Glover and I worked at Natick. You haven't mentioned a romantic aspect here of uh, getting getting married, oh. uh, raising a family, and coming to Natick. Tell us about how all that came about. Well, I was working at Cushing when it was a VA hospital, and Chuck was working there also, and I met him. He grew up in Natick, right down here on West Central Street, and uh, we got married. <laughs> we had three kids. Yeah, I don't think I'm overly romantic person. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not qualified to <laughs> respond to that. 
Dorothy, how important to you was serving in the United States military? It was important to me. How am I supposed to just on a scale of one to ten? Uh, it was very important to me that I served in work I liked, helping the fellows, the the military people that came across my path. Uh, I was very glad to be there if, in case they needed me in my particular field. Um, you'll probably find a lot of the nurses that worked in the wards had more contact with them. But uh, I was glad I was available when they needed me for their particular, if they needed surgery and I was there to help out. So it was important for that reason. But I thoroughly enjoyed working in the operating room. You went in a very uh motivated by very patriotic uh, reasons uh, to serve your country at a time when, when they needed nurses, as, yes. you, as you put it. Yes. Um, was there any time when you had a, a change of heart about why you had gone into service? That, did it live up to your expectations? I'm not sure that I had any expectations. I didn't say go in with the idea that I had expectations. I wanted to work. I was able to work in the area that I enjoyed mm -hmm. working in. I was there and worked when they wanted me. In fact, if you know anything about operating room nurses, they take call. And while I was overseas, I took call almost every night. Took what? Took call. We take it. Took call. In other words, during the night, if they need a nurse for an operating room, they have a list of nurses who are on call, on call okay. and uh, I took call. I was on call almost every night while I was overseas, and uh, if if they needed me, I'd work it. And I don't remember. I do remember not being particularly GI though. Uh, I, w I had, uh, while I was over there, I had friends among the GIs that worked with us. And, uh, but, and I was called to the office a couple times because I went to the movies and sat down. I always had a place to sit when I went to the movies because one of the fellows that worked with me always made sure that I had a chair. And I got called to the office because I sat down among a bunch of the GIs. I was an officer. That didn't go over, over very big. I said, that may be, but they were trying to be kind to me and give me a chair. And they'd go out and get me a Coke if I wanted one, and this type of thing. Because we were American women whom they probably hadn't seen in a while. And we were willing to talk to them. And I was impressed with that. that why? I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't on the battlefield. I wasn't in combat. And I remember one day, uh, the the charge nurse in the OR assigned me to a room with one of the GIs, who was my circulator. And uh, a little while later, she came back and said something to me. She said, "Well, you haven't. You have to make sure you get your work done today. You can't just talk to whatever his name." And I said, our work is done. We have finished our seven or eight patients that you had us do. We have finished, and our room is clean. Well, that wasn't supposed to be it. She had visions of us spending more time socializing than doing the work. Well, the fellow had been overseas quite a while with this unit and said to me when we started out, Let's make sure we get it done and get it done as fast as we can, as well as we can, so that she won't have anything to complain about. So, we did. Kind of, kind of stumped her. <laughs> yeah, I guess you showed her. <laughs> and we, and we didn't make a big yeah. deal of it. We just went about our business, did, and took care of what we were supposed to do. Dorothy, before we started this tape, you said you had some things that if I didn't ask you that you had a little list, what's Let's on the list? see, I, th that we left from San Diego Harbor, 
I, did, did, did we zigzagged across the island, hopped. You, we had one or two refuelings, and we were in the water, and the tanker came up to us. Um, I think you, you got it fine. You hit everything I had. We, okay, we came out at the end at the same place. Yes. Is there any other thing before we close this tape, thinking about people who will watch this a long time from now, that an American woman who served in the armed forces in, in the nurses' corps would leave one final thought? Is there anything else you'd like to say? I'm, I am sorry that I didn't keep uh, track or keep contact with some of the people that I worked with while I was in. Uh, there were, we, were, we left uh, and went down to Fort Jackson with a group of Massachusetts, primary Massachusetts nurses. Uh, some of them came from Beverly and Salem, and I wish I had kept track of people more than I did, because I didn't. And I, I'm sorry to, about that, and I think if you meet people as you're going along in whatever you're doing, job or whatever you're doing, is to make sure you keep f at least partial friendship with them. And I'm sorry I didn't. They probably feel the same way about not knowing where you are. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate it very much. Now, Bob's satisfied? <laughs>